I think the reason why you have a lot of a crypto native audience currently is because they feel like they're early to something, which is like so native to these crypto audiences who are farming airdrops or, you know, trying to be early to a certain token or meme token. Like that's really what's being monetized right now is being early. And as obviously we go months from now, I guess the question is how does Farcaster retain the audience? What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. March is just around the corner, and I wanted to make sure to give you a quick reminder to not top tick your prices of your DAS London tickets. If you use codes 0x10 at checkout, you can lock in a 10% discount on your ticket. Don't miss out on your chance to get ahead of the curve. I'll see you in London. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. The Blockworks research team is back to bring you another episode of an analyst roundtable. Today is Monday, February 5th, so this will be airing on Wednesday, February 8th or February 7th, actually. And uh, we're joined by Brick and Westy to jam on the latest market happenings. Also, as just a little update, Dan has actually moved over to Lightspeed for the time being. So he will only be uh, hopping on in the capacity that he's able to, but hopefully we'll get him back over the coming weeks here. Um, but Ren, do you want to kick us off with some uh, news and governance updates? Yeah, uh, for sure. It's been a relatively busy week as usual. Um, first of all, we have the Jupiter airdrop, which happened on Wednesday. I think in general, from the network perspective, that went pretty fine. I think we saw some like degraded network performance. It obviously took you a while to claim your Jupyter job and maybe sell it. But overall, I think the network sort of like remained resilient. I do know that Jupyter got a bit of community pushback. I don't think a lot of people understood their launch pool dynamics and how the Jupyter team was basically putting up 2.5% of the total Jupe supply for sale through the launch pool between the prices of 0.4 and 0.7, which equates to a FTV of 4 to 7 billion. And so I think the community pushed back because they basically thought, all right, we're going to do an airdrop. But meanwhile, the Jupiter team is also going to cash out at the same time. But I think like they got a bit of flack or a bit too much flack. Granted, there were some communication missteps or maybe perhaps too much communication from the founder. But overall, I think it was a relatively successful airdrop from the network's perspective. Anyone have any thoughts there? I have a question. So why exactly were transactions failing to go through? Was that more of a scheduler problem or more of the lack of like a like a really well-defined fee mechanism? I would say it's probably a combination of everything. One thing is like definitely like the scheduler and how it's like slightly non-deterministic. That should be partially fixed in 1.18 or at least like improved so that's probably one thing i think another thing was just like the rpc you use i think we saw tweets where like if you use the default rpc you probably your transaction didn't go through but as soon as you switch to for example like helios's rpc your transactions went through and just overall like network congestion i would say but yeah Next on the list, sticking with Solana, we have the Solana Mobile. I think they just announced that they reached sixty thousand dollars. Uh, sorry, sixty thousand units in sales, which far eclipses their previous round one, which I think they limited to twenty thousand. It'll be interesting to see whether they can keep up with sort of the manufacturing capacity. But I have no clue about global supply chain, so I'll let the Solana Foundation figure that one out. But I mean, it's interesting to see that like that's a pretty good amount of money for the Solana foundation, assuming they're the ones to sort of like build and launch this product. And I think other than like hardware wallets aside, it's interesting to see a company make their first big like hardware push. Will Solana one they become the Apple of Web3? I'm not sure, but I think internally within the Blockworks research team, we've always had our gut feeling that, you know, one of these like large, like either like protocols or companies, probably more so Coinbase, was going to launch a hardware product sooner or rather than later. Yeah, I think this is just a good move on both sides, both from the Solana Foundation themselves. It's a good revenue driver as well as a way to start sort of the mobile movement within Solana. Um, and then on the other side of things, it makes sense why there's a lot of pre-orders. I think it's pretty obvious it's going to be plus EV. With the amount of airdrops you're going to get potentially bonk coming to these addresses as well um so yeah i just think it's a no-brainer overall and i mean we're gonna to have to wait a year until these things are actually in people's hands um but at the same time yeah i definitely 
understand the move here. Totally actually talked about this in a recent light uh, speed podcast. And if I understood him correctly, uh, the foundation is producing these phones at a loss. Uh, and it's more about like trying to penetrate the market because I guess the problem here is that uh, it's going to be, or maybe better to let him explain it. So it's a good idea to uh, go and listen to that podcast. But I think the main problem is that it's kind of hard to rent seek, if you want to call it that, um, for the phone. Like it's going to be hard to basically take a cut out of the uh, fees generated through the like app store um, because of a certain like relationship between the app and then the end user um or if you compare against like a app builder that doesn't really once the app is built uh, it doesn't cost anything to like you know produce some more units you you can decrease your margin uh without becoming unprofitable as long as you're yeah basically that but then with these phones like even if you increase the supply, but uh, there's always going to be this certain cost of like increasing the supply. Sorry, I explained this really badly, but that's basically the <laughs> short. No version. worries. But yeah, I think to- totally has the angle of like, or at least yeah, I think he memes about it, but I don't know how serious he is about it, about disrupting the Google and Apple duopoly for context. They both charge, I think. 30% on any revenue generated through your mobile app. So for example, if you're cash of clans, someone pays $10 for an like expansion pack or like additional gems. I don't know what they call it these days. Um, Google and Apple basically take $3 off that. But yeah, if you're too poor to buy a Solana phone, just get a Solana sticker and stick it on your phone. It works a little differently, but same brand. Um, next up, we have LRT protocols expanding. I think LRT protocols have seen an incredible amount of growth. Like Puffer, so their TVO has gone like pretty vertical, really, really fast. Um, and now some of these LRT protocols are expanding that to L2. So for example, Renzo is expanding their staking to L2s, I think starting off with Arbitrum through Connects Network. I feel like there are some potential risks there with allowing like sort of like users to stake through an L2, but I would love to like hear your thoughts on like do you think these LRT protocols are here to stay? Is it too fast, too quick? Does anyone really understand the risk involved? I think they're here to stay. And I think we're at like literally like inning two or three of this, to be honest. I think it's going to get pretty crazy. Uh, I'm not personally partaking in like the the restaking protocol or the, the liquid restaking protocols right now, mainly because I'm a little bit worried just about how like the points allocation with Eigenlayer ends up going. Like, I don't know if... You know, if you have 200 points on Renzo of Eigenlayer points and 200 Eigenlayer points in like an EOA that you deposited directly into Eigenlayer, I just don't know if you'll ultimately get the same Eigen allocation once that airdrop actually happens. And in my opinion, it's like Eigenlayer is definitely want, launching at like a 20 billion FDV or something like that. And I don't know about the LRT protocols as much. So I just kind of think it's a little bit risky to to gamble on that. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine because I mean, obviously Eigenlayer is incentivized to to make sure that all the people who deposited in these LRT protocols are, are happy because ultimately they're customers of, of Eigenlayer as well. But it's just a little bit dicey when you have such a layup on the Eigenlayer airdrop, in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything Sam said. I also think the end state of these LRT protocols uh, is that they just can keep competing with one another to get more users yield, et cetera. And this move of Renzo expanding to L2s is just one step. And what Sam said is like the first inning of what these LRT protocols are going to do. But I think eventually, you know, as we start to see riskier and riskier protocols pop up, the fact that LRT, LRTs themselves already stack risk, uh, smart contract risk on top of smart contract risk. I just think, the end state of these things after a couple of years when they're all competing for the most yield with all the users that some of these are going to end up uh, blowing up and contributing to um, yeah, pretty big uh, blow ups within the Ethereum space. So I'm definitely cautious about using the LRT protocols uh, 
And it's hard to tell who is really winning the race at the moment, since I keep seeing another one pop up every day uh, that increases their TVL. So yeah, that's, that's how I'm thinking about the LRT space at the moment. What I don't understand there is like, how many of these protocols do we need? The number just keeps going up and up and what are really the competitive advantages there? Like you being seen as the safest project, I would reckon, and you having like the most liquid underlying um, that you're issuing. So like based on those two factors, it's yeah most likely going to be similar to the LST market and you're just going to have like a few winners and then all of these other projects drop off. Also, I at least I hope that at some point crypto market becomes more efficient at pricing risk. So like if a, one project pays out, let's say 10 basis points more than another, but its mechanism is much more riskier. Like at least I'd hope that people still choose the project that pays less yield, but on a risk adjusted basis is better. Yeah, definitely agree with all your points. I mean, it'll be interesting to see the market dynamics play out, but I think like LSTs, it's should be, uh, like winner takes all or like a few winners will dominate the market. But I think there's a nuance there in that different LSTs have different AVS exposure. So it's not exactly like plain vanilla, like Ethereum staking where like everyone has the exact same risk exposure, different LRTs will have different risk exposures. So maybe, maybe we'll see a world in which there are like multiple like dominant LRTs. What's up everyone. March is approaching fast and I want to give you another reminder not to miss out on DAS London. It is coming. It's right around the corner and it's in March from the 18th to the 20th. We have three full days of content. This is your chance to bump shoulders with some of the world's top executives and have open dialogue with both attendees and speakers. We're going to be focusing on a range of topics that I'll let Ren discuss for you. First on the list, we have Bitcoin Catalyst, the halving and spot ETF. Next, we have a view from the buy side from investors on things like strategy, portfolio allocation and more. We also have a topic on RWA's tokenization and stable coins, which I think we can all agree are going to play a large role in crypto's future. We'll also talk about global regulatory frameworks like compliance best practices and the evolution of global standards that are shaping the global investment landscape. We'll also have someone from the institutional front to talk about infrastructure such as banking and payments with financial giants like Visa and JP Morgan. And last on the list, the macro case for digital assets. So don't miss out on this monumental event. Seats are limited, so be sure to register today by hitting the link in the description and using the promo code 0x10 to save 10% on tickets. See you in London. Moving on to our next news, we have ApeCoin L2. Um, they're basically, there's an ongoing vote in the DAO as to which L2 that they want to launch on. There's a few options. I think one of them is Polygon, one of them is Optimism, one of them is Arbitrum, and one of them is ZK Sync. There's a few... There's a slight controversy there because Polygon bought a significant amount of Ape and they are using that to vote within this proposal as to like which roll-up stack that they should use. I think it got a bit of pushback. Personally, I don't think it's that bad. You're buying like quote unquote equity in a company. You're using that to like basically partially decide the direction of like a governance vote not that much different from like a shareholders vote and obviously you would do so in a direction that's beneficial to your own company you know like i'm not gonna like be a manufacturing company buy stock in apple and then use it to like uh choose another like manufacturing supplier that makes zero sense so i don't think like it's one of I, if anything like i think it's better than tradfi at least like you get the transparency that you know like polygon bought x amount of ape they're using it to vote on this proposal rather than like all of this happening behind closed doors you have no idea who's like voting um but other than ape there's also been a lot of l2s that are trying to quote unquote incentivize treasure dao to build an l2 on the stack for example zk sync optimism and scale so i mean like it kind of just seems like good old-fashioned bd wars is happening again but this time it's for protocols to build an l2 on your roll-up stack rather than just building on your l1 for example, I'd be interested in hearing how you guys think this plays out. Like, is there a winner or is it just who has the most money? I don't know. One would hope that it's the best deck that wins, but I'm not quite sure about the fact that you can just, or I'm not sure I agree with the fact that 
it's a transparent way for companies to operate uh that is be being being able like just buying tokens of the market and immediately go and vote with those because yeah actually i don't know how it works with companies but at least when a fund buys a large allocation of shares they have to like uh make an announcement about it and then the market has time to react and blah 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 meanwhile here yes you can see if somebody's buying the tokens but you can just do it immediately and i guess there are really no restrictions so in the worst case scenario let's say a few projects are like neck to neck and then somebody just decides to acquire some tokens on the market and like push over the vote which would not be ideal in my opinion hmm. yeah that's definitely a fair take as far as things on the new segment we have elixir elixir is like a decentralized market making protocol and they are setting up pools for rabbit x on february 6th so it could be a potential play if you want to start your job while also sort of farming the elixir farm at the same time sam was there anything you wanted to add there Nope. I just think it's a pretty good play, honestly. Like people are looking for things to do on Starknet. That token's coming that token is coming soon. And uh it's a good perps platform from what I've been told. I haven't actually used it myself, but if you look at the daily volume leaderboards, it's pretty much every day Rabbit X, Hyperliquid, DYDX V4, V3, and Vertex at the top five. So definitely like a a promising protocol and worth using if you want to trade. Yeah. Lastly, for the new segment, we have clusters, which is sort of like a multi-chain ENS or domain name using Layer Zero uh, as an underlying technology. I think you've seen a relatively large amount of activity within like these like on-chain names recently, especially with Farcaster, which we'll dive into a lot more later, it's seeing strong growth. But also, I think ENS recently announced a partnership just this morning with GoDaddy. So I haven't read into what the partnership entails, but I would guess you can use your ENS as a domain name, which is like pretty cool. If you buy like an ENS, then you like own the domain name and you know, you can set up a website under your ENS. So I think that's really interesting to see. Yeah, I, I like this idea too. Like, I don't know exactly how clusters works underneath the hood, but I do know like it's a pain in the ass when I'm like dealing between a phantom wallet and a MetaMask or Rabi wallet. And I have to like remember the names from or the addresses from chain to chain. It'd be really nice if I just had, you know, Sam <laughs> and I could just send, I'm sure I wouldn't actually get the one Sam. That's uh, only three letters and I'm sure someone would grab it before I did. But nonetheless, it would be nice to have like one domain name that I could send across chains to um, just identify my addresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all right. Next, we have a quick word from Chaos Labs. Thanks to our fantastic sponsor, DYDX. This week, we have Omer, CEO of Chaos Labs on for our DYDX segment. This is quick starters, what is Chaos Labs 20 million launch incentives for DYDX? And do you mind giving us a quick rundown on how it's done so far? Yeah, the $20 million liquidity incentive um, or launch incentive program for DYDX is a program meant to bootstrap liquidity and encourage migration uh, to the new DYDX chain from previous versions like V3. Uh, the idea here is to incentivize early adopters who are driving volume on the platform and driving organic flow. Um, so that's high level. The, the program is structured across seasons and should run around six months. Um, and the incentives are distributed in DYDX tokens uh, through governance at the end of each season. You really can't argue with the fact that the incentives have worked pretty well uh, so far, but I'm curious on the market maker side, because a lot of the critiques and worries heading into V4 was that market makers wouldn't want to set up the new infra. Has has this actually been what you've seen, or do you think most market makers have successfully market, migrated over by now? So the volume is, has been really, really impressive. Like if you compare um, around the current time frame, the, the volume that UIDX chain is doing versus other prevalent uh, perpetual protocols, it's been number one for a lot of the time uh, since the launch of the program. So I think those concerns have been put to rest. Um, and the incentive programs is, is actually performing and serving its purpose and in incentivizing people to migrate over and giving them sufficient motivation. So. There's still room to grow, um, and we're seeing that happen week over week, but the the start has been very, very strong and promising. So 
focusing on the statistics, right? Um, what type of numbers have you seen so far? Are there any outlier statistics that perhaps you weren't expecting? We would love to get us sort of like a rundown. So the last, right now we're on season two. Uh, we've seen on the DYDX chain over almost 22 billion in trading volume across 34 different markets, uh, over 2000 uh, traders and 1,100 market makers have been earning points through the program that we're administrating. Um, and then there's some a lot more interesting data on like the performance of trading traders in the market, like liquidations and so on. I think what's really also nice to see here is the amount of deposits. So we, we spoke about new infrastructure and having to migrate and all of these things. Well, in the early weeks, we've already seen over 40 million uh, in USDC deposits on the DYDX chain. And then I do want to ask a little bit about wash trading. What is your guys' methodology or how are you guys going to try and combat that? Because obviously in crypto, whenever there's incentives, there's people who want to try and extract those incentives in the most efficient way. Let's talk about what wash trading is, or, or at least how we're defining it. So basically when you're administrating a program like this, everybody knows that in crypto farming is a really big uh, part, trying to get the points, uh, trying to get the airdrop allocation. Um, and really, it's hard to differentiate between users who are organic and supporting the, the, the platform uh, in there because they find value and just folks that are either setting up bots or, or there to kind of maximize on that airdrop allocation. Um, with the wash training module of Chaos Labs, we make that distinction and differentiation. Uh, so we run uh, several different algorithms that are rooted in the latest academia research uh, on how to detect wash trading with sophisticated metrics and conditions. Uh, we do an analysis on on basically graphs uh, in the trading venues. So basically takers and makers. Um, and then towards the end, we're able to see if there are any cycles. So if, so a really, really naive example, and I'll show this now when I pull up my screen, is two traders who are trading back and forth. Their PL will stay net neutral um, throughout the, the trading season or throughout different positions, but they're doing incredible amount of volume. And this is typically something uh, that we define as wash trading. And we don't want to incentivize it or encourage it. So there's a blog post about it uh, on the Chaos blog. We also go into detail about it on the DYDX forum. And we kind of give some intuition for how the algorithm work, how all the different algorithms work and how we're detecting cycles and graphs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure there's, <laughs> you know, can't really fit it into a five minute segment <laughs> how extensive this uh, this wash trading detection actually goes. But I'm glad to see that you guys are actually taking a thoughtful approach, breaking this up into seasons, kind of doing retroactive rewards based on activity and doing your best to reward the behavior that you want to see. But I do believe that's all the time we have for today. So Omar, thank you so much for coming on. If you want to leave the audience with uh, where they can learn more about Chaos Labs, DYDX, we can link to that stuff in the show notes after, after, uh, after we're done recording here. For sure. First of all, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about Chaos Labs, the easiest is Twitter, chaos underscore labs, or on our website, chaoslabs.xyz. Uh, we're always happy to talk to builders. Uh, thanks for having me today. Yeah, of course. Let's get on over to Hot Seat and Cool Throne. All right. Back to the Hot Seat Cool Throne segment. This week, I think, we'll let Wesley go first. I know Wesley's got some cool data that he wants to show. So Wesley, please go ahead. I will share my screen for you. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, in the cool throne this week, I have Spark Protocol, which I've been seeing a lot on my timeline recently. So for the, a little clarification, Spark is a sub DAO under MakerDAO. Uh, it's essentially a money market similar to Aave. I believe it's a fork of Aave V3, but they actually have a direct deposit module from Maker uh, into the money market. So users can borrow DAI against it. Um, but yeah, Spark has had an immense rise over the past nine months. Uh, I believe it, it launched in May of last year and now has over, I think, $3.4 billion in supplied value and $2.2 billion in borrowed value, which you can see on our BlockWorks Research Analytics page that Ren pulled up um, for those watching on YouTube. Um, but yeah, this, this rise has been obviously attributed to plugging directly into Maker, but they're also in the process of what they call pre-farming for their token, where users that are uh, supplying volatile assets and borrowing DAI are able to earn up to 30, like a, a pool of 30 million Spark tokens, which represents 2% of the total supply after four years of farming. Um, and from there, we can expect SubDAO farming to commence in May of this year. So coming up in a couple months, and the way that works is the first two years, 
500 million of the SOD tokens will be given to farmers uh, with 350 million of those going to uh, the stable coin farmers. So not die, but there's they're rebranding die to new stable, uh, which is yet to be named. And then 150 million of that 500 million is going to the new government's token that's replacing MKR. Um, and then from there, the following two years after that, you got 250 million split up the same way evenly across the stable coin and the new governance token. And then the remaining four years, 125 million are split up. And so I think obviously with Spark's immense growth over the past nine months, we can expect there'll be a lot of eyeballs on subdial farming when it goes live. Um, people are obviously farming as much as they can right now for even such a small amount of the Spark supply that once, you know, subdial farming starts, I think there's going to be a lot of eyeballs. I think, you know, Maker is obviously going to benefit on the back of this, given that there's a portion of the subdial farming going to those that want to use Maker. And yeah, I just think, you know, Spark Protocol is killing it. They're top eight in DeFi TVL overall and didn't exist a year ago. So yeah, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on Spark. I think the narrative is definitely there after the January 1st, especially after the January 31st FOMC meeting where I think Jerome Powell was a little more hawkish than expected. And I think maybe the market is realizing that we may not get as many cuts as they thought we would. So obviously with higher interest rates for longer, that benefits MakerDAO just from off like increased interest revenues, especially from all of their RWAs. And I think that naturally carries over to Spark but on top of that, you also see leverage or stable coin supply starting to come back, right? If I'm not wrong, like December and January was one of the first months where USCC saw a growth in the stable coin supply, whereas like in the previous one year, it's like straight up being a down only chart. And so that bodes well for MakerDAO. In addition, USCT, I think hit a absurd market cap, like 97 billion. And I think the statistic was that USCT made or like Tether specifically made more money than the entire like Goldman Sachs. Like USCT made 2.2 billion, Goldman Sachs made 2 billion in Q4, and USCT is probably run by like 1 100th the manpower and resources of Goldman Sachs. So it's really interesting to see all of that play out, especially like on chain in the form of MakerDAO. Yeah, one one thing maybe worth noting is that. If you think about, for example, holding USDC or borrowing DAI or like creating a vault and then taking up DAI, like those are two different things. So kind of for DAI to grow um, big time or a lot, uh, the market's like demand for leverage has to go up because otherwise the like circulating supply kind of doesn't increase. Um, but it will be interesting to see now that if that kind of paradigm starts again, where I guess we some are already saying that we are in a bull market and it's going to get much better from here, then I think I could see huge growth when like people want more leverage. And now there's an even easier, it's much easier to borrow through Spark protocol than it is to set up your own vault or whatever. Yeah, I think Spark's going to be a home run. I remember we had Sam McPherson on, one of the co-founders of Spark, uh, or a contributor. I'm not really sure what his title is at the exact moment, but he definitely had some cool things to say, and I recommend going back and listening to that one for sure. But, I mean, like you said, Ren, just to recap, rates are higher for longer, um, the demand for leverage is returning, and you have sub-DAO tokens as well as almost like a, a split for the maker token, so it'll look cheaper on paper to to retail, and you get a fresh chart. So... As stupid as that sounds, we've seen it worked like way too many times in the past to to fade it, to be honest. But unfortunately, US people can't farm that airdrop, unfortunately. Yeah, there's definitely a reason why, like even in a world of equities, they do stock splits all the time. But Sam, who do you have in the hot seat of Kuton this week? Yeah, I definitely picked the easiest one of the week. I've got Farcaster. It's a social media protocol slash backend built on uh, Optimism mainnet. So Farcaster is like the backend of the protocol. 
and it's essentially just the account management. So you sign up by calling the contract on OP Mainnet, and in return, your wallet gets assigned a Farcaster ID or an FID, as they call them for short. And this process, unfortunately, requires like multiple steps and transactions, and you need to like rent storage, add a key, um, and a couple other things, which is kind of cumbersome. So like you can use a uh, ENS domain, which they support, as Ren alluded to earlier, if you want an on-chain solution, but the FIDs are actually off-chain and stored between the peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes. But regardless, the clients make it a lot easier to sign up. Warpcast is the most popular client right now, and it's a, a blend between like Twitter and Reddit. And I'm not going to lie, I tried it last week, and it, it is very smooth. Like I find the channels super, super compelling, much better than Twitter lists. I feel like that was like their failed attempt at, at channels, honestly. Um, and uh, it basically just streamlines the account creation process and you give that uh, client a key to tr transmit transaction data on your behalf, which is basically propagated to other hub operators. Um, so basically you have apps, which are like the clients that you're interacting with at the top of the stack. And then you have actual Farcaster for account management at the bottom of the stack. And then you have the hubs in between them, basically propagating information that's sent from users of the different clients to each other. Uh, and that stuff's technically off chain, but it, it's still pretty damn decentralized. Like they call it a sufficiently decentralized social network. And I would actually agree with that testament. We saw Warpcast go down because it's experienced such explosive growth. But, you know, your data was always there and propagated between the network of hubs. Um, and you could have interacted with any other client that's built on Farcaster, despite Warpcast being down. So that actually is a huge improvement over the current things we see. I will say I'm a little bit apprehensive just because we saw the friend tech hype. We saw threads for ex uh, like a minute. Everyone was like, ah, like, let's switch over to, to threads from Twitter. And it you know, didn't actually pan out. So I, I don't know if it's here to stay, but it definitely feels a little bit more special than any of the things I just mentioned or lens, no shade to lens, but the UX over there just isn't that good in my opinion. Like with too much on-chain stuff, I think this model's a lot more solid, I guess. Um, the question just comes down to for me is how are the hub operators going to be incentivized to store and propagate all this data as you know, it actually grows. That was like kind of my main tip with Noster back in the day. And this seems a little bit better because people are paying to rent when they set up an account with uh, Warpcast. So maybe, you know, if you have a successful client, it could be pretty cool to see the competition between the different clients. Um, nevertheless, I think it's going to like, I guess, spur innovation at the app layer uh, for, for different social media channels all built on Farcaster, which is super interesting. Another thing that I've got to mention when talking about Warpcast is Frames, which is basically an extension of Facebook's open graph protocol. So basically, in short, they allow creators to embed applications directly into an iframe within the Warpcast UI. Um, so instead, like normally on Twitter, you know, you see a link, it gets butchered by the algo. Uh, you click on it, it takes you somewhere else. You got to maybe buy something, log in, create an account, check out. It's this whole process. This kind of alleviates all of that. You can just click on uh, the frame and then since you have a wallet associated with it, you can just check out right there, which is pretty neat. I could see a ton of use cases coming from this, like purchasing items like I mentioned or using an application like a game without actually leaving the Warpcast UI. So that's pretty promising. I guess my take on this is it's got a long way to go. Like personally for me, the, the frames don't work half the time, to be honest, and I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Maybe I'm just an idiot, but definitely isn't super smooth yet. Um, but I can see like how they'd be really good for gaming or NFT mints or community building. So still wrapping my head around Warpcast, but I think it's going to be a pretty big deal. Um, on top of that, like meme coins over there have gone, you know, 10 to 100x over the last month or so since people started using it. Uh, a lot of people are tipping people in this token called DGEN, which is pretty funny. Um, and I also think uh, a good way to play the adoption of it is probably just longing OP, not financial advice, but metrics on optimism are going to look good right as we head into 4844 and we have an ETH spot ETF narrative, narrative hit, uh, heating up. So that is my cool throne. Do you guys have any takes on Warpcast, Farcaster, et cetera? Yeah, I think as far from like a business model perspective, I think it's fairly interesting they charge seven dollars a year for basically storing all of that data and with that seven dollars you get five thousand casts which is basically their version of tweets you get two thousand five hundred reactions two thousand five hundred links 50 profile data and 50 verifications and 
anything that exceeds the thresholds that I just mentioned basically gets pruned. Um, kind of similar to like blob pruning, I guess. Um, and you can pay more for more storage. So in this sense, like Farcaster is probably a social network with, I want to say 20,000 followers. I haven't checked the Dune dashboards yet. And it's turning on. It's like fee switch from day one. You know, if people are willing to pay $8 a month for Twitter premium, but still have to deal with like millions and millions of like bots, spam, scams, like surely you'd be willing to pay $7 to get access to Farcaster. On the other hand, I don't know what their DA costs are, how much they're paying to like post all this data, but I feel like this is kind of like the other use case of sort of DA layers, right? There's like so, there's such an abundance of DA. And on one hand, like it's going to take us a long time for us to reach a world where we have like thousands of roll ups or maybe not that long. Um, but decentralized social media or like even decentralized identity seems like one of the solutions that's going to fill up that DA layer. And it'll be interesting to see whether Farcaster basically fills up that DA gap and how much data they really produce and how much they're able to monetize. You know, if they're able to get 10 million users on Farcaster, that's like 70 million a year, not even including, I don't know, maybe like some ad model where they turn on and perhaps like the ad model could be an ad model that social media or like web two social media hasn't really explored before, you know, like you can put ads, but then the ad money goes back to, for example, like users to some B switch or whatever. And it's uniquely enabled by crypto. And yeah, I'm just very interested to see all of these like experiments play out and the different like market dynamics of a slightly more crypto native, like social media network. Yeah. I think the thing that I first start thinking about is like comparing this with friend tech and how sustainable is this, but I think this, this time it made me different, uh, because I remember with Frentech, it was more about the underlying token mechan or the key mechanism that got people hooked on it. And then because the product itself mm, wasn't that good, it was hard to like, you know, just open the app and like continue using it. But here I feel that there might be like tangible developments compared to, for example, Twitter, or at least their potential for those. And I guess as long as the teams continue developing and like smoothing out the experience and introducing all of these like new cool features, then yeah, I think that this uh, platform could be super sticky. Uh, but it also comes down with it's so hard to bootstrap a social media site. So I think it comes down to like continuing with this momentum that uh, the platform has had during the like recent week or so. Yeah, I personally see a lot of comparisons between Forecaster and Threads when it came out and that, you know, everyone is piling in, everyone's starting from scratch and needing to build their followers up. So you have most of your timeline is just engagement baiting, like not really quality content, just whatever hits people's dopamine centers, gets a bunch of likes, a bunch of follows. Um, and I also see some comparisons with friend tech, although obviously you're not like buying and selling keys of these people. But I think the reason why you have a lot of a crypto native audience currently is because they feel like they're early to something, which is like so native to these crypto audiences who are farming airdrops or, you know, trying to be early to a certain token or meme token. Like that's really what's being monetized right now is being early. And as obviously we go months from now, I guess the question is how does Farcaster retain the audience? Like, obviously this is a good bootstrapping mechanism to get a number of crypto natives on board, which they've done a really good job already, but how do you get people that aren't crypto native and how do you get the crypto native people to stay and make this their home base? And even if that's successful, one thing I'm also thinking about is let's say crypto Twitter does migrate to something like Farcaster, does that sort of silo the conversation to a new social media platform that maybe normies who are trying to learn about the space don't have access to or don't know about? And so all the conversations that are happening on Twitter that they see are super low quality because all the high quality people have left. So we need to make sure that we're, you know, controlling the narrative 
and getting quality information out there at the same time. So yeah, that those are like all my thoughts on Farcaster at the moment. I think I'm really excited about frames because if you think towards like web two social media, right? Every big app that took off introduced a new like exciting media form that caught on and eventually stuck around until they reached just like viral app status, right? For example, Snapchat posting pictures and videos that like automatically deleted TikTok short form like reels be real you don't like the front and back camera i feel like i'm too old for all of that stuff um but farcaster has the potential to do the same with frames right for example i know our big bosses mike and yano are really excited about the intersection of uh farcaster and prediction markets so as a news and media organization maybe there's something we can do there like every time we put out like a news article, you can bet on a prediction market within a frame, right? We put out a prediction mark, uh, we put out an article about say EIP4844 and you can predict and bet on whether you think 4844 will happen by before March or after March, you know? And you can extend that to like quite literally anything given the extensibility of frames. For example, like micro payments to read like one of Tully's latest articles or buying something like integrating shopping experience within a frame. I feel like at some point, like people are going to build innovative enough frames that attracts an audience outside of the core crypto audience. And I think it's very possible that they replicate like a cleaner, less spammier, like more fun version of Twitter, even outside of crypto circles. Yeah, I agree with that. But then that kind of comes back to the point of like having to maintain momentum when building because i feel that uh, you mentioned be real which kind of reached some popularity but then at some point it just like plateaued i guess it really didn't um like introduce anything that new at the end of the day and okay maybe the business model was kind of broken because you had to post a picture every day of your life and like most people's lives or everyday lives probably aren't like that super super interesting so I guess that's also a reason why the platform kind of died down. But let's say Farcaster comes up with something really innovative in let, maybe a year and a half. But in between that time, like nothing has really changed. Then it's going to be hard to, again, like um, bring on new people and gain this new like hype around the platform. I think something that could be sticky for Farcaster is if uh, people, or sorry, protocols use it as a filtering mechanism for for airdrops. Because obviously, we don't really have a, a proof of human yet, but I think this would at least improve an airdrop allocation. You know, if you're active on Farcaster, then, you know, and you can prove that and you already paid your rent storage for that year, then maybe if you're on that list of users, you can get an airdrop for some protocol. Like I'm sure we'll see some of that because we're already seeing a ton of like bounties being posted for unique ideas with frames. And if you can just tap into a network of users and use a frame to provide them an experience, like that, that's very strong for community building and something that could keep people coming back well into the future, in my opinion. Yeah, as a as a closing point, I think what I'm excited about is the ecosystem and the fact that like any developer can come in and build on Fame. And I think just within like 24 hours of Fame's launching, right? Uh, this was probably organized beforehand, but you saw like hacker houses in New York. You saw hacker houses in SF led by, for example, Varian Fun and Jesse from Base. And you know, like it's really like whatever you can dream of, just go build it. And I feel like we see a Cambrian explosion of like just fun, innovative frames within the next like two or three months, obviously like there will be probably risk involved. I wouldn't be too surprised. I know this was a, pan a point you made Sam in our warning card that like one of these frames is going to have like an exploit in it and no one have, will have any clue on how to audit that. And that will definitely be a risk. So tread carefully. Maybe moving on to my, or this week's cool trunk for me, uh, which is tried airdropping their native token STRD to stake TIA holders. Um, and yeah, basically Stride is a liquid staking token um, IBC enabled chain, which already dominates most of the like markets within the ADOM ecosystem. 
um, and they will drop 5 million SDRD, uh, which is worth around a 20 mil as we speak over the next 150 days or so. Uh, and it's cool to see because uh, in the past few weeks, we've just seen more and more projects like mess around with points and like, yeah, we might do an airdrop at some point, but here's a point program first. Let's see what happens. Uh, meanwhile, here the rules are like well defined, and you know in advance that like the airdrop will be proportional to the holder's like percentage of the total eligible STTA supply. Um, and yeah, basically STTA holders on Stride blockchain, and then those who LP on Osmos and Astroport Neutron will be eligible with. 3 million tokens being dropped in the first 60 days and then 2 million in the next 90 days and the drop happens on a daily basis but it takes six months after the allocation for the tokens to west um and yeah i think like since the lst market is mostly a winner takes all this is a really well thought out kind of scheme to attract sticky users over a certain time period and then also yeah once people get used to or people are probably already used to using stride because of its like large market share in these other other um atom ecosystem projects like stride will probably do really well in the in the longer run but yeah do you guys have any opinions on this yeah, I think obviously, like I really like the no BS. Like we're just gonna give out five percent of the supply to stake the uh, uh, stakers, and that's like a pretty hefty amount, you know. But obviously, with the whole like modular money narrative, I would guess they're making a bet that that five percent of the supply that that they're giving out is well worth it. Not just in terms of like any potential free revenue from like stake Tia but also being the de facto, I'm not going to use the word canonical, but maybe like preferred liquid staking issuer within like any like Cosmos or like IBC enabled chain, right? And I think like overall, the design of Stride is relatively interesting from an architecture perspective, right? How they use like interchain accounts so that anyone can issue LSTs from other external chains on Stride. And that's something that it, it kind of feels like Ethereum is struggling with these days for example like rap stake if you're seeing snapshot vote after snapshot vote people have to rely on like external bridges in order to bridge like rap stake if to say bnb chain or avalanche whereas cosmos like doesn't really have that problem today you know like obviously interoperability is still a big concern for ethereum and it's like roll-ups and there isn't a good solution there yet and Cosmos does genuinely have very interesting tech that will probably get copied by Ethereum at some point or later. And I think Stride is a great like index bet on the Cosmos ecosystem like overall or like the IBC ecosystem overall. Right? Like the first bet that you're probably gonna make is like Celestia. But I think the second great bet would just be like whoever's gonna issue all of these liquid staking tokens for all of these proof of stake chains. And it seems like Stride is a clear winner right now. Yeah, it's not even stride for all proof of stake chains. Like to me, this announcement specifically in terms of like their raise plus the STIA uh, incentives to me show how much they want to penetrate the Celestia market, not just Celestia in terms of TIA, but Celestia in terms of the rollups built on Celestia. Because if you noticed in the raise, it included Neil Samani of Eclipse who's building a rollup on Celestia, as well as Sam Ozer is building Sovereign Labs, which would be a role as a service provider on Celestia. And so to me, Stride clearly sees Celestia rollups as another place where they can sort of plant their flag um, as these rollup tokens come out, but also specifically with Tia. Obviously, this is a bet on Tia becoming quote unquote modular money, where Tia is used throughout rollups on top of Celestia in some way, shape or form. And they're hoping to obviously be the number one uh, liquid staking provider of TIA. And with that comes 
um, some pretty big advantages. I think we're probably going to see some of these Celestial rollups copy the Blast playbook of having sort of native yield to their rollup, uh, but have that be actually an LST underlying within the bridge. And obviously T is a perfect candidate for this, given it'll be on many rollups and has a pretty high staking rate. Um, and so, yeah, the, I just see this as a really great move to establish themselves within the Celestia ecosystem. I do think they'll become the biggest, at the very least, TIA LST, if not, you know, the LST for all these rollup tokens as well. So yeah, just great move overall by Stride. I would also just add, I do strongly believe that we're going to start seeing STTIA get the airdrops, if you will. You know, in the past, we've seen people try and cybel TIA staking uh, via staking, obviously, to get airdrops. And I think that it makes a lot more sense to airdrop to STTIA holders because those people are actually liquid and they can come partake in your ecosystem. So I think that'll be a pretty big push moving forward as well and also helps contribute to the modular money narrative. So it's just kind of in everyone's best interest to do so. Yeah, one last point on Stride is staked DYDX. Um, with Stride's product, staked DYDX, it basically auto compounds the rewards into more DYDX. And DYDX has been doing like a pretty hefty amount of volume on V4. I think the metrics have shown strong growth, and that could be another clear winner uh, in addition to staked Tia. But all right, Vic, go ahead. I was going to close this off by saying I realized I kept saying Adam ecosystem instead of the Cosmos ecosystem. So please, all the Cosmos homies, don't come after me. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Rick. Um, that's on the hot seat good zone this week on uh, maybe a bit of the hot seat. I would call it uh, Crypto the Game. I think it's a game incubated by Delphi. It's basically an on-chain crypto survival game. So it's basically replicating Survivor, but like with a mix of like on-chain elements on it. Um, right now, I think the price should be well above 100K, $100,000 in ETH. And you basically have to pay 0.1 ETH to play. After you get started in the game, you get assigned to a tribe. And then every day, your tribe slash team faces an immunity challenge ranging from competing in arcade games to going on a digital scavenger hunt. And then whichever tribe wins the daily challenge gets quote unquote immunity. And the other tribes have to vote some of their own players out of the game until ultimately the game is left with one player who wins the entire prize pool. That's not the interesting part for me. I think the hot seat part was Anish, um, one of the founders at Ritual. He basically added 200 contestants to the game and paid around $50,000 in doing so. He instantly became the largest voter base, comprising, I think, 40% of the player base. And he said, like, on Twitter, this he was open to alliances. And he blasted all of this on Twitter through a tweet. However, the game developers basically commented on a tweet saying, like, did you read our terms of service? And then a bit later, they basically revoked all of those participants, or they removed all of those participants from the game. And they got a, a lot of heat um, for keeping the $50,000 that Anish basically deposited in order to play that game. So that was like definitely questionable. But then I think Anish made a really good point, right? Like, I think on chain agents have a place to play in an on chain future. Obviously, the first like iteration of that is probably like more so transaction space, having an on chain agent control like your wallet or like a multi sig stopping like malicious actions. But it's not that hard to see a world in which like AI agents participate in these type of like online games or protocols. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting like experiment, so to say. And I wouldn't be su too surprised to see on chain AI agents get deployed more and more. You're already seeing like AI agents being deployed. Maybe not on chain, but for like airdrop farming protocols where they try to randomize your activities. Um, and I think the other super interesting thing about this was that he created a prediction, or not he created, he took part in a prediction market on Poly Market and he put up $15,000 against him winning on Poly Market. I think when he first tweeted about it, there was a 10% odds of him winning. Now there's a 25% odds of him winning. And like you could say that one may vote on yes, 
initial win for crypto the game and then you use that to influence like within the game who they vote to kick out and if you bought like the yes shares then you probably wouldn't want to kick out a niche so i just saw like it's very interesting like bribery mechanism so to say and i wouldn't be too surprised to see like more types of these like really interesting vibes or like hedges come to fruition on party market just given how much party market is taking off in overall volume especially boosted by the presidential election this year yeah i mean this is like a perfect case of where proof of personhood or maybe what sam was talking about where linking farcaster accounts where there's probably some programmatic way programmatic way to make sure there's no ai agents in this game and you don't have to rely on a terms of service it's just automatic um, within the game itself that's first and foremost but second i think it's awesome what anish is doing here i know anish is pretty big in the mbv space as well and obviously he looked at this particular mechanism as a way to arbitrage basically the mbv between you know the winnings and uh prediction markets being able to basically create a way to have positive expected value both for himself and the rest of the players playing um i thought it was really really cool um i'm excited to see how this plays out in the end if he does win i mean it, it's in the, every individual's best interest to basically bet for him in the prediction market and vote for him to win and they even though they lost the game they still win uh on the prediction market so i think it's pretty cool overall my thing is the game just doesn't sound very fun to me it sounds like like a discord grind to get on a white list except you have to pay 0.1 eth to partake so i'm gonna pass on playing but that was a very very clever use of prediction markets i agree westy i will say i know some people that i've been playing and they said they, they've been saying it's super fun um but i haven't been playing myself so i can't can't say anything about that but yeah i just wanted to say that fair take i'm glad you added that color honestly because i also haven't even seen any of the games that are being played here but brick did you have something to add there yeah i wasn't gonna say that the whole prediction market point opens up another can of worms where like uh you might have these situations where it becomes or your ev is 100 percent better um in a situation where like you lose uh on the thing you're or like you win the bet but you lose on the kind of underlying thing so then suddenly you become like incentivized to kind of destroy your own actions sorry that was a bad explanation but let's say i don't know you're a football player and then you're suddenly able to like um bet on your own game and nobody can kind of uh scream for that then you're of course, like, okay, that's illegal, but, you know, it's kind of the same thing here in a way. Yeah, I definitely agree on that point. And I think, especially in Asia, you see a decent amount of, like, rivalry for teams to lose already, whether that's, like, traditional sports or, like, esports. So definitely something that I could see having very important implications. Like, I don't know, maybe one day a dev who hates his job crazy prediction mark is saying like will this protocol be hacked before like <laughs> this state and then like i don't know maybe he buys no um maybe he buys yes and then like hedges against himself like actually hacking the protocol or so something ridiculous like that um but on the point of like the game being fun or not i haven't played the game myself too so i don't want to comment on that but i definitely could see that one day there's this like super viral game I don't know, like maybe like Pokemon Go, but with like Pudgy Penguin IP, you know, and then like everyone gets like permission to access to play this game and it becomes this like super crazy, like viral movement, you know, I think like when Pokemon Go first came out, like no one was ready for how much it would take over the world. I remember like just like to like 1 million people flooding like Central Park in New York because there was like a Snorlax and there was just like crazy videos on the internet. I think it'll be really, really cool to see like a movement like that happen once again but with like either crypto native ip or facilitated by crypto rails someday 
you just made me think of an idea too, Ren. Like, what if you back to Farcaster made a client that's literally a game? Like, there's so many different things you could build in the context of gaming and crypto, and like we just haven't quite yet seen it come to fruition. But I agree with you; super exciting prospects. Yeah. All right. I think that's a good point to close it out. If no one else has anything else to add, um, thank you, Westy and Vic, for coming on this weekend. See you guys next week. Hey everyone, thanks for watching today's Zero X Research episode. I wanted to take a second and remind you about our upcoming 2024 Digital Asset Summit in London this March. Seats are limited, so hit the link in the description and use the promo code 0x10 to save 10% on tickets. See you in London.